so we're good to go. All right. So for our case study, Rita, 48-year-old Hispanic woman, long history of obesity. Have we done this one? I get them all mixed up because I do them all the time. I feel like I, I feel like I just did this one. So, obesity, diabetes, dyslipidemia, <coughs> reactive airway disease. Presented to the hospital emergency department with five-day history of weakness, tactile fever, productive cough. That's what I have. Nausea, vomiting, except for mine's unproductive cough. I don't even I don't know what a productive cough is. I assume some. Does anyone know what a productive cough is? One that's getting stuff out of the way. Is that what it? Yeah. Okay, well then I have a productive cough. Patient report and chart reviewed confirmed that two years before this presentation her diabetes had been managed with diet alone. She's on glipizide, metformin, which I think has the worst name on the planet, which is glucophage. Basically for me that means it's a virus, right? I don't know if you guys know that phage is a is a virus. I just always just think of it's a Sugar, sugar virus or something like that, but and ultra lente insulin were added because of poor glycemic control. Oh, I just gave you a subliminal message about what it was. Anyone want to guess what Rita has? No guesses? She has diabetic ketoacidosis, which is where your blood has too much ketones in it. Your blood glucose, basically what happens is your blood glucose gets to, uh, spikes. Your cells are not taking up glucose, so they start processing fatty acids too much, and that builds up to ketones in your body, your breath will actually smell like acetone. You know what acetone is? Nail polish remover. Nail polish remover. So, so if, you have a, if you know somebody who has diabetes and they smell like they're just drank a gallon of nail polish remover, you understand why. Um, their pH is less than 7.3. That's what happens if you get into that modality. <clears throat> really what happens is Insufficient, absent, or ineffective insulin. So fat, just because normally what ends up happening is in a muscle cell you get you'll take in glucose. You'll end up with increased glucagon, increased fat cells, fatty acids, glycerols are converted to ketones, and that goes through gluconeogenesis, and we end up with increased uh, ketone and glucose production in the bloodstream, and that's what causes all the problems. Plus, glucose in the bloodstream is not a good thing anyway because glucose is very reactive. So, <clears throat> and this is gonna be an increasing problem because of the number of people who have diabetes is increasing significantly across the United States, especially type two. Type one is relatively stable, but they think there are seven million undiagnosed cases, and 25.8 million people. This is the number one, when I do a poll in my big classes, this is the, one of the number one problems that's heart disease, diabetes. They know, almost everyone knows somebody with diabetes of some kind. Does everyone here know someone with diabetes? Pretty well? Okay. Crazy part is, the number of new cases are increasing substantially every year too. And it causes all kinds of secondary <coughs> impacts, things like double the medical cost, 67% of nerve damage, 10% risk of amputation. Number one cause of new blind cases, number one cause of kidney failure, 2x risk of increased heart attack. Our costs are outrageous, $250 billion. I can't, if, 
this is probably one of the most important diseases that we can address. And, you know, and that's 10% of the population. So one in 10 of us. All right. This kind of gives you an idea of what we're looking at as far as diabetic ketoacidosis. We, the blood pH is probably one of the number one indicators. Um, you also start to see ketones in your blood. So, and, um, and other byproducts of fatty acid metabolism, which we'll talk about here in a minute. All right, so we're going to switch gears quite a bit right now. Today we're going to talk about, the right now we're going to talk about the transition between glycoly glycolysis and the Krebs cycle. So we talked about eating food, right, especially your favorite bagel, something like that. Gets put into what what process? Anyone? Come on. Glycolysis. Yeah, it gives it. Yes. First, what it is glycolysis. What else has to happen before glycolysis too? I'll take glycolysis because it is the right answer. But there's also something else that can happen in between, right? If we have any kind of glucid. Uh, Glucagon or any kind of other carb advanced carbohydrate, starch or something like that, what happens? Yes, by debranching enzymes, right? Okay, so we're going to talk about as soon as we get through glycolysis, we're going to end up at this transitionary point where there's a couple steps that aren't technically part of a cycle, although almost everyone puts them in to the Krebs cycle. That's what we'll talk about this pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. Um, we'll talk about how it's regulated. And we'll, then we'll start getting into the citric acid cycle. We'll talk about how the citric acid cycle is regulated and its role. So, again, glycolysis. And I'm, I kind of, kind of put these in here a lot, just to kind of subliminally give you the information multiple times. <coughs> Hopefully, you start to pick up on some of the ideas. <coughs> and it's also helped me out too because I forget. Every, you know, I, I give this lecture like three times a year. So it's not I have to go back and look at it again. <coughs> so inputs, glucose, we take require two ATP. We're going to get out of the cycle. Two pyruvate, two NADHs, four ATPs for a net of two. Krebs cycle, we're going to take two pyruvate from glycolysis and two acetyl-CoA, which comes from the previous Krebs cycle, right? And we're going to put out NA six NADHs, two FADH2s, Four carbon dioxide and two ATPs. We'll talk about the electron transport chain in the next lecture. So, and this process again is called cellular respiration, the Krebs cycle and electron transport chain. In order to make ATP, the body breaks down mostly carbs, so most of our sugars, some fats, and very small amounts of protein. Most of the time, protein is recycled, and the energy conversion of protein is pretty poor anyway, although there is ways that it can be processed. Under aerobic conditions, we're going to have pyruvate. <clears throat> it's going to enter the mitochondria. So where does glycolysis take place? It's, yes, it happens in the cytoplasm. This is we're going to start now going into the mitochondria. So under aerobic conditions, uh, pyruvate is going to enter the mitochondria, and we're going to get, it's going to be converted into acetyl-CoA, which is the molecule you see here. We talked a little bit about it yesterday. Um, that is going to be the starting point for the citric acid cycle, and that's going to basically take, the citric acid cycle processes um, these acetyl units, <clears throat> and it converts them into CO2. And then we're going to take some of these molecules. We're going to, it's going to be a lot of oxidation steps in this process. And we're going to generate some ATP in there. And then we're going to take that and put it into the electron transport chain. So here's the overview of the entire process. This is just to give you an idea. We're going to, we're going to actually talk about this step right here first. Because <coughs> up at the top we have our glycolysis. And then we're going to have our acetyl-CoA, our pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, and that's going to be the start of this cycle here, where we generate two carbon dioxide, we have a bunch of NADH uh, molecules, and we're going to generate uh, two ATP out of this cycle. 
it's a four carbon acceptor, this, this process is. And um, from there, we're going to go again into electron transport. So, so keep in mind, guys, that that acetyl unit is kind of your base unit. It's a two carbon <coughs> base unit that's used. Thanks. <coughs> End product of glycolysis is pyruvate. There's a complex that we'll talk about. That's in the mitochondria, this pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. It's a matrix enzyme. It's actually, it's actually a complete co a process or a complex. It's, it's more than one protein and more, more than one enzyme. We're going to oxidatively decarboxylate pyruvate to form acetyl CoA, and that way we can introduce acetyl acid cycle. It's irreversible between glycolysis and the citric acid cycle. And here's kind of the net reaction of that step in here that it's going to exist. And this also serves as a junction point for a couple other molecule uh, processes we'll talk about a little later. In, in fact, it's the fatty acid cycle that we're going to talk about. All right, here's the complex. There's actually three protein sub uh, three enzymes, and I shouldn't say that because a lot of these, I say three proteins. I actually don't know how many. Pro, there's three protein complexes here. A lot of these things have like 30 or 40 proteins in their complexes. So I'm, I'm not going to, these are uh, the proteins that you're going to see. So we've got E1, E2, E3. They all have specific functions that result in this net <coughs> uh, reaction. So first E1 is a pyruvate dehydrogenase. We have a dihydrolipoil transacetylase. We have a dihydrolipoil dehydrogenase. And so basically, we're going to go from pyruvate, okay? We're going to go to this intermediate here, and then we're going to end up, CoA is going to come in, and we're going to take, um, and we're going to put on this intermediate step, this intermediate acetyl group um, that's transferred on this sulfur here, right? What's our sulfur molecules? Our sulfur amino acids. Yeah, so what are, what are they? There's two of them. Remember, they're the ones that form disulfide bonds. Cysteine. Cysteine. Is that what's here? What's the other, what's the other amino acid? Methionine. Is this cysteine or methionine? Good guess, but no. <laughs> it's cysteine. Um, so that cysteine is going to take this acetyl group, we're going to add it to CoA, and in this process here, we're going to end up with acetyl CoA. And in the process, we're going to generate NAD, right? So, out of that molecule. All right. Again, three steps. So this is kind of a net reaction. We're going to take pyruvate. We're going to decarboxylate it. So one of the byproducts is carbon dioxide. We're going to have an, uh, an acetyl group here. Um, it's going to, we're going to oxidize that acetyl group, right? So we're going from a negative to a positive. That's going to be done on that cysteine residue in that enzyme. And then from there, we're going to transfer that to a CoA molecule, and then we're going to end up with acetyl CoA. I know this is riveting. And this molecule complex, I said there's not just one protein in here. This kind of gives you an idea. Uh, so the green are our E3 molecules <coughs> in here. Our E2 are red, and our E1 is yellow. So our pyruvate dehydrogenase component, actually there's an alpha 2, beta 2. There's different complexes in this whole big process. And this kind of gives you an idea of what the cartoon or ribbon structure would look like in this whole subunit. <clears throat> so here are the complexes. 
E1, E2 with a dimer. Like this goes through and shows you how all of these different molecules are transferred between in this six step process and how each one then ends up transferring all the other molecules. This is the, the six step reaction. I don't think we have this on the test, do we? I don't think we need to know this in detail. It's just kind of a, a good reference point. We need to know there are three different subunits E1, E2, E3. That E2 is a dimer, um, and that you, you start with pyruvate and you end with acetylcholate. And you need to know the names of these things. Pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. Now in this process, pyruvate combines with an ionized form of um, the coenzyme thiamine pyrophosphate, also known as TPP, and <clears throat> that's also the step at which we're going to see CO2 formed. So and we're going to form hydroxyethyl TPP out of this complex as an intermediate. So pyruvate forms with a carbanion of TPP. We're going to add two protons. We're going to end up with hydroxyethyl TPP and carbon dioxide. So in the carbon dioxide step, that's actually the reaction that is formed in the decarboxylation in the first step. Thiamine pyrophosphate is derived from the vitamin thiamine B1. It's vitamin B1. A lot of your B vitamins are associated with energy production. So how many of you guys drank Propel? So if you look at that thing, like that's what they put in there's all the B vitamins. A lot of these vitamins are associated with energy metabolism, and that's actually some of the reason why you, in theory, get a bump in energy from it. Um, <clears throat> so I'm trying to think if there's anything other else that's really important for you to know. But, in the oxidation step, which is the next part, a two ca uh, carbon fragment is oxidized, and we're going to uh, transfer this dihydrolipoamide to form acetyllipoamide on E2, which is then which is catalyzed by E1. So we go from this the hydroxy TPP plus lipomide, and that um, we end up with a carbonion of TPP again and acetyllipoamide. Uh, That's step two. Here's a dihydrolipoamide. It's formed when we attach um, the vitamin lipoic acid to a, um, a lysine residue. So we have a lysine side chain up here. We're going to take the lipomide here, and we can see we have a reactive disulfide bond right there, and that's where you're going to see most of your, um, your catalytic action going on. All right. Coenzyme A then goes to acetylipomide, and then we end up with acetyl-CoA, and we end up with dihydrolipomide there at the end. So that's how we end up getting acetyl-CoA. So where is the sulfur coming from? Is it coming from the lipomide, or is it coming from You've got a lot of sulfur in there. Do you want to go back to your previous slide? Mm -hmm. Yep. So you've got that really reactive lipomide, but that reactivity doesn't actually stay with your CoA. So the sulfur group that's in acetyl CoA comes from CoA, not lipomide. All right, again, formation of acetyl-CoA from pyruvate is irreversible. Acetyl-CoA has two principal fates. We can A, enter the citric acid cycle, or we can incorporate into fatty acids, which we'll talk about next week when we talk about biosynthesis of fatty acids, which is very, very exciting. It's regulated, <clears throat> so this complex um, is regulated by phosphorylation. So there's a, a, a <coughs> amino acid that's phosphorylated, 
and that leads to an inactive pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. What, what uh, enzyme adds a phosphoryl group to a protein? Kinase, bingo. What's the, what takes it off? Yep, good guess. Didn't say that. Good answer. You were, I said guess because you were a little bit hesitant. Is it on the slide? Oh, it's right there. <laughs> I guess if you're paying attention, it's easy. Okay. Um, this is regulated, again, also by the amount of charge that we have. So certain molecules are going to provide charge. Things like um, our NADH and our acetyl-CoA and our ATP are going to be charged. If there's, uh, if there's a lot of high energy, then pyruvate is going to be blocked. If it's low energy, right, we have a lot of positive charges, it's going to go through. So we have two mechanisms of regulating this. Um, in, uh, did you want to talk about this one? Well, this is just really to talk about how pyruvate dehydrogenase is one of these key enzymes because it's an irreversible step. So if you can <coughs> that key enzyme, you can actually, um, you can do a couple of different things. So here what you're seeing is that Cancer cells take up a lot of glucose, and if we can stop glycolysis, then we can actually stop cancer from growing. So cancer cells are taking up approximately 66% of the glucose, and they metabolize it through fermentation, because that's a lot faster than um, all of our other processes. And because it's so much faster, they can grow a lot faster. So if we can block that, um, it's actually going to be very, very beneficial. So one of the ways that they're trying to look at blocking that is by blocking pyruvate dehydrogenase. Uh, because then you can, pyruvate gets processed to lactate, lactic acidosis, and that's what uh, cancer cells are doing. That's how it shuts it. It goes down the fermentation path. So if we can block that, we can potentially block fermentation in cancer cells, and then they won't grow as quickly. So this is just one of the clinical strategies that they're trying to try, that they're going to try. Um, so one of the things that they're looking at using is this hypoxia inducible factor. So do you guys remember what hypoxia is? No? <coughs> so hypoxia means you just don't have enough oxygen, right? It's what you feel like when you're at high altitude. You don't feel like you can suck enough oxygen in. And so um, one of the ways that your body deals with that is they produce different transcription factors that help deal with low oxygen conditions. So hypoxia-inducible factor one, or HIP one, um, enhances this aerobic glycolysis in cancer cells. So this is another way that cancer cells have kind of hijacked the system because then they can um, start producing more pyruvate dehydrogenase. And if they can produce more of that, then they can shovel more glucose into fermentation so they can grow faster. So that's another point of regulation that we can um, try. And then um, if we can inhibit that dehydrogenase, then we're going to prevent the formation of CO-CoA. If we permit the formation of CO-CoA, um, that's what cancer cells are doing. And so then that shunts that pyruvate into lactic acid, again, allowing them to grow faster. So if we can block along any of those steps in the pathway, we have a potential new So I've been married to Amanda for, what is it now, 24 years? It's going to be 25. Is, tw is, your, is this 25? This is 25. You better take me on a trip. <laughs> better take you on a trip. <laughs> 
So we've been married for 25 years. And my wife, forever, she loves science, right? But she always considered doing cancer a complete sellout, right? Because no one really is interested in cancer for cancer's sake. They're always like, well, first off, she thinks that they're just chasing the money, or they may have had someone in their family who's died from cancer, right? And I don't mean to minimize cancer, right? But this is, so I just, I just need to point out that Amanda has like sold her soul this year, sold out and started doing cancer research for the first time ever. No, it's not actually cancer research. It's silk research that can impact cancer. That's what I care about. There's a really cool bacteria, you guys, that uses <laughs> hypoxia. And so this bacteria, it can, it's got a homing signal that goes along a hypoxic gradient. So it goes to the minimum amount of um, oxygen concentration, which is in the center of the tumor, and then starts growing and proliferating and killing the tumor from the out, which I think is just really fascinating. I think that's really cool. And so, so uh, we're going to take and encapsulate it in one of these silk bubbles that I make that only releases that when it gets close to the tumor and then the homing signal kicks in and the bacteria will go and infiltrate the tumor and kill the tumor from the inside out. That's why I think it's cool. I didn't sell my soul. It's still so I just have to give her credit. <laughs> I actually, I'm, I've actually received several grants from cancer, so I'm. I'm You're a sellout. <laughs> I'm being true to my science. <laughs> All right. I'm going where the science leads me. <laughs> All right. I the reason I said that is because I just find it ironic that she's so into the cancer thing. So. All right. So let's go into citric acid cycle. <clears throat> and this is a cycle. It's a true cycle, meaning. The imp so we're going to start over here, we're going to start with acetyl-CoA, and we're going to end up um, back with some of the products of the cycle are going to be inputs for the next round. So it truly is a cycle. The other way was a pathway. This truly is a cycle. We're uh, and I'll go over all the details. So we'll start with acetyl-CoA, and the terminal output of the Krebs cycle is oxaloacetate, and that actually is going to be part of the reactants that start the cycle again. So this is a true cycle, and it serves as the hub of the cell. Of birth. There's going to be a lot of things that are going to be inputting. So we talk about fatty acid catabolism, and we talk about um, amino acid catabolism, these are going to be feeding in. There's all kinds of cycles that feed in and out of this hub, the citric acid cycle. There are a lot of books that actually have this as the first. I, does, my brain doesn't work that way. I'm, very, I'm pretty sequential. I like things to go right down the list. But there are several books that have this as the center, and then people go around and discuss all the other avenues by which you can enter the, the citric acid cycle. Again, I'll just reiterate that this is also known as the TCA cycle, which I think is a tricarboxylic acid cycle, and the Krebs cycle, just for your, for your reference. And this is what I showed, showed yesterday in great detail. This is a, in significant detail. I think this is an excellent diagram showing all the different structures and all the different molecules, all the different coenzymes, all the different products and reactants, all the different types of reactions. So if you see water coming off, what kind of reaction is it? Condensation. Condensation. If you see water coming in, it's a hydrolysis, right? You see NAD plus going to NADH, it's a, yep. Well, that's a reduction, right? NADH, or NAD plus is being reduced. We can say it's an oxidation or it's a redox reaction. Um, so all those things are definitely, and you can so all these things are there. We also have the different structures that that are that are uh, being produced out of this molecule. So, all right, and so what we're going to do is we're going to go in all in. I won't make the mistake I made yesterday when we start diving in for because we have a lot of different steps that are associated with this. This note here, here comes pyruvate. Here's our pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. Our input, input point is acetyl-CoA, okay? And we're gonna take and we're going to make oxaloacetate, right? 
at the end of the cycle, and that oxaloacetate and acetyl CoA are going to form and go into citrate. Right, and that's the uh, some people call this first whatever step you want to call it. That's what it is. <clears throat> Here's the important carbons that come in. Okay, we're going to take a C2 from the glycolysis cycle, and we're going to add a C4, which is the oxaloacetate, which is the end product, and we're going to make a C6, and then we're going to take it back down, and we're going to have a C4. Now, the carbons actually don't aren't what's transferred to the electron transport chain. What's actually transported, what's actually, so at this point we're done with carbon, right, from the electron transport chain. What's actually delivered to the electron transport chain? Right, we get NADH, FADH, right, those are what are delivered, and protons are, are going to be delivered to the electron transport. So carbon is spit out in the form of CO2, right? So you breathe in oxygen, you breathe out CO2. This is where that CO2 comes from. And we'll show you where the oxygen is necessary in the next. And it's kind of amazing how fast you need that oxygen, right? We can die within minutes without having enough oxygen. Kind of gives you, there's no way of storing it. So we'll talk about all of that fun stuff. Here's this same table for your reference. If you're desperate to find information, this gives a really good overview of the postretic groups, the enzymes and coenzymes, and the energy required for each of the reactions. I'm not going to go into detail. It's just there for your reference. Again, the big picture is cellular respiration is an I. I'm a big picture person. That's why you see the same thing over and over and over and over. And that's just to keep reminding you where you are in this grand scheme of things. These two cycles are cellular respiration. Right now, we're going to talk about the <coughs> acid cycle. That's what we're talking about. Fatty acids, glucose via glycolysis, and amino acids all can go into acetyl-CoA. And we're going to end up in this cycle right here. From here, we end up with our eight electrons that come from what are our two coenzymes that deliver the electrons? Yep, our NADH and our FADH2, right? So that's how we deliver eight electrons to the electron transport chain. And this oxidative phosphorylation or electron transport chain. The electron transport chain is actually the first four, right? And oxidative phosphorylation is actually the FO, F1, ATPase in, in included. I think that's the distinction. I actually don't really care. So I just call the oxidative phosphorylation or electron transport chain. So I don't distinguish between the two. Um, I think there probably is, but I'm not going to get into that level of detail. All right, so <clears throat> from our previous products, we have oxaloacetate around. From our pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, we have acetyl-CoA around. Here's our C2 carbon. Here's our C4 carbon. We add them together, and we're going to get this citral-CoA. Okay, so that still has acetyl-CoA attached to it. So here's our CoA and, and our sulfur attached to our acetyl group. So in the intermediate, we have a citral CoA. In a hydrolysis reaction, we're going to spit off CoA. It goes away. It is recycled in the process. And then we're going to end up in the first step, which is citrate, which is a six carbon uh, structure. There's a couple of different really, really good PDBs entries on this. So if you're interested in doing and looking at this and seeing how this works, there's if you look on the PDB, there's two really good models that show this um, the citrate synthase, which is the enzyme that does the condensation reaction here. And this is um, basically <coughs> what it looks like. It's a dimer. And there's two sites kind of fit into each other, like two hands together. So the blue is on top and the uh, yellow is on the back. And there's two sites that form at the junctions. Those are the oxaloacetate binding sites. And that's where we generate our molecule. This is an induced fit model. So there's an induction that happens once oxaloacetate binds and the formation of that intermediate, that citral-CoA, 
causes a structural change, and that's going to actually act, complete the active, uh, active site. So we have two confirmations for this. So. From there, the second step, we go from citrate to an intermediate of cis iconotate in what kind of reaction? In a condensation reaction, we end up with cis iconotate, right? And then, sorry, and, and, yeah, and, and then we end up have another hydrolysis reaction where we end up with isocitrate. The net result out of this is we're basically going to move that hydroxyl group. That's the net result out of the reaction. This is the, a nice picture of the molecule in the month on the PDB where you can see the binding site for a conotase. <laughs> And there is a poison. You guys are you got you were saying that they need right? There's a suicide inhibitor, fluoroacetate of this that disrupts um, it's irreversibly inhibited. So and shuts down citric acid cycle. And it's used as a pesticide in this. So Yeah, so one of the things you guys will get in pharmacy school is learning about Alpha ketoglutarate, next step. So we're going to take our isocitrate for the last step. This is where we start to generate some of our electrons. So isocitrate, and we're going to go from NAD8 uh, plus to NADH, and we end up with oxylosuccinate. Right? So you can see what ends up, and we end up with the proton. So you can see what end up here. We end up with the carbon oxygen double bond. And, um, so we end up with oxidized oxaloacetate. Uh, From there, we're going to um, we're going to uh, cleave off carbon dioxide, right? This uh, um, there's a uh, carboxyl group right here that's going to be uh, chopped off, and we're going to end up with alpha ketoglutarate. So the enzyme that does this is isocitrate dehydrogenase. Again, it's another allosteric enzyme. What does allosteric mean? <clears throat> okay, that um, that's around the subject. So uh, it's a good it's a good start. Okay, so let, let's clear up what that means. So an allosteric an allosteric enzyme is one that changes conformation, right? Upon binding, it's going to change its conformation and it's going to allow it to bind. So, isocitrate dehydrogenase is inhibited by ATP and NADH, and it's activated by ADP and NAD. So, it's regulated by allosteric changes. The protein changes its conformation, the protein changes its shape. I, I haven't said this enough, have I? Structure equals function. I usually say that like 5 billion times. And this is a good example of structure equals function. The reason that I keep harping on this is because it's an important, very, very important concept in everything that we do. And if you take that even a step farther back, functional groups dictate structure. That dictates function. Here's a good example, another good example of that in action. So if this is inhibited when ATP levels are high or NADH levels are high. It's activated when ADP is high or when we have a lot of NAD+. So the efficiency of the enzyme is dictated by what? The concentration of the products or the reactants in the whole mix, right? In the cycle. All right. Alpha-ketoglutarate. Um, we have our next enzyme, which is our alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. It's a complex as well. So when we're going to go from alpha ketoglutarate, we're going to reduce NAD plus or NA to NADH, and we're going to knock off our second. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, we're going to knock off our second carbon dioxide, which is this carboxyl group on alpha ketoglutarate, 
and we're going to attach into a, a CoA. So we end up with a succinyl CoA. So we're going to knock off another carbon and we're going to end up with a succinyl CoA as an intermediate. <clears throat> This enzyme complex, again, is inhibited by our products, which are what? Yep. And? ATP. Good guess, though. It's activated again by ADP and NAD+. Plus. All right. Next step. I don't find a lot of pleasure in going through all of these one by one by one. I th it's there's a couple of things in this in biochemistry that I'm always like I don't really know the value in me just going through everything. <coughs> I do it anyway because I don't know a better way. But so if someone comes up, I've said this like 50 times in every class that I've said that I've taught. If you know of a better way of me presenting this information, I would love to hear it because frankly, me just describing to you the amino acids, or me describing to you functional groups, or me describing to you all the steps in all these reactions is not necessarily overly compelling because frankly you have no frame of reference even though it's happening a, a trillion times a second in your body right now which is kind of crazy to think about and you have no conscious awareness of what's going on but that's beside the point if there was a great way if there's a great way that you guys to think of I would love to hear it so the next step is succinyl coa <clears throat> We're going to take our phosphorus, our phosphoryl group, and our ADP, and our succinyl CoA, which is the product of the last reaction, and we're going to make succinate, right? Which is basically going to take off our CoA, and we're going to generate an ATP. Here's our enzyme, which is a succinyl CoA synthetase, and we're basically going to generate the energy by cleaving the thioester bond, right? We have this thioester bond right here. So we have a CoA sulfur thioester bond right there. And that's going to generate the necessary energy to give us our ATP. Now, really, it's GDP. But we're splitting hairs at that point. So. This uh, reaction mechanism is actually quite complex and there's some really interesting about chemistry that goes on in here. <clears throat> so orthophosphate displaces coenzyme A and that's going to generate um, a succinyl phosphate. It's got this high energy bond right there or right there I should say. And from there we're going to kick off our succinate. We end up with phosphate group attached there. From there, phosphoryl group is transferred to a nucleotide triphosphate, sorry, nucleoside triphosphate, and from there, it's going to swing over, oh, sorry, I said that backwards. Step three, we go to phosphohistidine residue, so here's our histine residue attached there. From there, we're going to form our ATP molecule when that phosphoryl is transferred over to ATP, from ADP. Sorry, I got ahead of myself. <coughs> okay, our next, our series of steps, we're going to kind of, this is a complex, our succinate dehydrogenase, fumarase, and malate dehydrogenase are going to catalyze a series of reaction that are going to generate some more FADH and more NADH from there. So step six, we're going to oxidize succinate to fumarate. This again is an oxidation reaction because we're going from FAD plus to FADH2. Succinate to fumarate. And for fumarate, we're going to have a hydro uh, hydrolysis reaction where we're going to form malate. Okay. We're basically going to add a hydroxy group and a hydrogen to break up that double bond there. Then we're going to go to a another oxidation reaction where we end up with oxaloacetate. And once we end up with oxaloacetate, we're back where we started and we can do the whole thing over again.
This is the step seven, which is going to be from fumarate to malate. Um, so malate is a chiral molecule, as you can see there. Um, and it can exist as a pair as an enantiomers, but in this cycle it's only producing it's only produced a single uh, stereoisomer. It's L malate, if you're curious. Um, this is a reversible reaction, and fumarase can actually be attached to a membrane if it needs to be. Here's a little more description about oxidation of malate to oxaloacetate. In this, one of the things that I, I put this up here for is it, it kind of shows that these protein complexes are pretty intense. They're not just some kind of, you know, a simple protein. These enzymes have a lot, a lot of structure. And I can promise this structure has meaning, right? We don't just have this structure, simple enzyme in there, so that at one site we can react and go on our way. This, these complexes have, all of them, have really important functionality throughout. Um, otherwise, we just wouldn't have them. All right, so we're back at the beginning. Now, <clears throat> hopefully, as I start to see how all this is coming together, we have, again, we started off with acetyl CoA. Well, we started from, off with pyruvate from the glycolic cycle, which is converted in, uh, to acetyl CoA in the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. At the, one of our products from the <clears throat> citric acid cycle is oxaloacetate. We merge the two to form citrate, and off we go around the cycle. And we're going to spin off. We're going to spin off. So we're going to, um, going to generate some NADHs along the way. We generate um, some FADH pluses, and we're going to generate GTP <coughs> in these cycles. <coughs> so let's take a break. I think it's a good place to stop. We're a little under halfway with all of our slides, and then we'll figure out where the rest of the cycle takes us. Fatty acid, beta oxidation of fatty acids. Okay, we'll do it, Dory. No, you're fine. So our visitor today is Dory. Dory is um. Oh no, I totally don't even know. Dory is one of our puppies. Dory's a legit service dog in training. She works for definitely dogs, which is so she's either going to be a diabetic detection dog or a a hearing um, detection dog. I don't know. Thursday, I guess I'm diabetic. Yeah, so we donated her to Definitely Dogs in Iowa, and they're training her to help me. And then they'll donate her to Family Dog in Iowa. Or do you need to go to Family Dog? Oh, she's asleep. Family Dog in Iowa. But I'm going to train her. Or do you train her? So she can visit us. She's having a couple issues, so she got sent home. So. <laughs> So she did bark me that it's up, and she can't do that. So we're working with her this summer to try to make sure that she's fine with other dogs. So what they do is, for most service dogs, they send off the puppy to handlers until they get to be about a little over a year. About 18 months, actually. Yeah. And um, the problem was that the puppy handlers that had her... They really messed with us. They didn't know what they were doing. So they came, she, they, she, they sent her back for us for eight weeks to get her over some of the issues that she's had. She's really strong. She's seven months. Yeah. Oh, okay. She's doing really good. She did this most of the day. So Yeah, she's been up here all day. Now, to be fair, we run her like crazy at night. So <laughs> she we, gets lots and lots of exercise. We burn her up at night. And she has a lot in the morning, she gets to play with all her. She has a pack. Brothers and sisters and moms and dads, and so she runs around the yard like. So you're gonna run an acre yard and you're gonna get five to inch acres and you put them all out for the last three months. And then at night she goes and wipes. Ah, uh, no, ma'am. It's a man. <coughs> I know. You were just joking. <laughs> okay, just joking. 
He did better than Odin. <clears throat> she just sat there most of the time. Odin like, had to raise the table and all kinds of little stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you can see that. Yeah. Well, uh, to be fair, it was a very small room. <laughs> we might bring Odin back one day. Yeah. So Odin, you guys are just so lucky, right? Yeah. Yeah, but he, um, so he, he's a canine good citizen, and he will be, um, so Amber Bach Gorman, who is in the counseling office, she is a certified therapy dog a trainer or assessor or something. So. Um, we're gonna take Odin and she'll, she'll, I think later this month or next month she'll he'll get certified so he can run around and be a therapy dog. Yeah. You don't have to. Um, not as much as you might think. Well, I have lots of them, so. Mm -hmm. I have my favorites. That aren't going anywhere. My favorite is Siggy. Um, so, she's not going anywhere. As long as I have Siggy, I'm good. And it's her dog. Odin. They keep it Odin, or is he No, he'll probably stay. Odin, uh, so the problem is we have males and females, and it's just a big mess, right? I'm trying to keep everybody <laughs> separated at the appropriate time, because <laughs> they don't really care. Uh, we care, but they don't, so. Um, well, it's more, um, you know, Odin's enormous, and Anya's not. You can, uh, Dory's about, I think she's probably like 45 pounds, so she's got about another 20 pounds before she's full size. And you saw how big Odin is. Many of those two, they, they'd certainly do it, but it would not be. It wouldn't. I don't know. I don't. I don't even want to think about what would Anya would have to go through to pass Odin puppies. So, um, yeah. So, and, and you know, I Vinny is like total police dog. Like if you pictured a police dog, it's Vinny, and um, that's. Um, the little puppies. I don't know if you see, have you guys seen the little puppies? No. Well, we'll bring one of the little puppies in one of these days, like after the test. Abby. Abby's my favorite. <laughs> my favorite little puppy. She's a super stud. So that dog's going to be amazing. So, and I'm trying to figure out how, how I can keep her because I really like Abby. When you so, say puppy, how old? Eight weeks. Oh, a puppy puppy. A puppy puppy. I mean, she's a puppy. Dory's a puppy, but. Yeah. Abby is Abby's a puppy puppy. Probably the cutest puppy you'll ever see. Except for Winston, of course, right? He's adorable. <laughs> That's Brad's dog. So anyway. Okay, so 
Um, yeah. So what is the direct from glycolysis? It's two. No. That's the net. So you, probably where you're getting confused is we actually use two to generate four. Right? So the net is two. If you want to talk about gross, it's four. But you, 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 you spend two in making uh, the glucose one phosphate and the fructose one six bisphosphate. So you add two phosphate groups on, and that's what costs you the two ATPs. Does that answer your question? Okay. All right, so um, <clears throat> this is from yesterday. So this is a recall moment. We've got glycolysis on one side and gluconeogenesis on the other side. And you might recall that when we go from pyruvate to phosphoenyl pyruvate, um, we also have an oxaloacetate regulation step that occurs right here. And that's also important in the process, which is a product of our cycle right there. Again. So our net reaction, we start with acetyl CoA, three NAD pluses, an FAD. An ADP, a phosphate group, and two waters, and we end up with two CO2, which we have to exhale, three NADHs, an FADH, an ATP, and two protons, and a CoA. So 2.5 ATP when we use um, reduced oxygen in electron transport chain. So that's how many ATP we're going to generate out of that. Um, the FAD plus will generate 1.5 out of reaction with oxygen and electron transport. So if we want to regulate this, it's regulated primarily. I've described, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and that's where some of the, all of these numbers, again, can get really, really dicey if you start trying to figure them all out, like net versus gross, and we're going to take two instead of one, and all that kind of stuff. So if we put one through, you're going to have one ATP, right? But since we generate two from, yes, right? Yep. These are regulated by ATP and NADH. I've, all the way through the process, I've told you about where they're regulating that, but that's the primary mechanism by which we do that. The key ones are isocitrate dehydrogenase and alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. So these are regulated at this point, which is our pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, right here, which is our isocitrate dehydrogenase, and right here, which is our alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. So these steps are regulated and regulate how much we're actually ATP we're going to generate out of the Krebs cycle. Um, I suspect that that's something you're going to need to know. Just so, just, um, I don't have a firm answer on that, so don't quote me, but I, if I were you, I'd know those generally. And I'll let you know more, I, I'll let you know more for the final. <clears throat> So not only does this cycle just perpetuate, but sometimes, I shouldn't say sometimes, we spin off molecules from this cycle that are put into other processes. So uh, from oxaloacetate, we can make our amino acids, our purines, our primidines. We talked about that yesterday um, when we talked about the pyruvate or the pentose phosphate shunt. We can also go back to the gluconeogenesis from oxaloacetate. Citrate, we can make fatty acids and sterols. Alpha, alpha ketoglutarate, we can make glutamate and other amino acids. And we can also make our purines for our nucleotides. succinyl coa we can make uh, polyporin, which is our heme and our chlorophyll, which are big complexes that are basically huge ring structures. So all of these 
when we talk next week about biosynthetic you know, and uh, anabol anabolic processes, this is what we're talking about. This is the frame of reference in the citric acid cycle that you'll want to kind of pay attention to. Now the rate limiting step in this whole thing is the car uh, pyruvate carboxylase, which um, does also replenish oxaloacetate if we need to. Um, we can also, so we can re regenerate pyruvate from oxaloacetate, uh, we can regenerate oxaloacetate from pyruvate if it gets too low. So, and acetyl-CoA can be produced from the metabolism of the pyruvate and from fatty acids. So we can, there, there's plenty of reactions that are going on in here that can be, that are enzymatically driven, that can facilitate making more products, or sorry, more reactants that can, that can then be used throughout this cycle. Biology is kind of a crazy thing. We have enzymes that do all kinds of things in this, and they're regulated, and they're also extremely redundant. So anapleurotic reactions, um, this is where we take pyruvate and we can make oxaloacetate from. The, this is a pyruvate carboxylase, and this is also used in gluconeogenesis. So this is a step we can make to facilitate making oxaloacetate, which we need from pyruvate. So if we're just spitting out pyruvate, which happens a lot, we can, and we have a rate limiting step in oxaloacetate, we can have an important pathway or an important molecule that is added that will allow us to continue that process. There's another pathway, pathway uh, glyoxalate pathway, and this allows plants and some of our microorganisms um, to grow on acetate because acetate um, is very, very common and sometimes um, we're not going to have some of the other uh, important coenzymes, some of the decarboxylation enzymes in the citric acid cycle, so the glyoxalate pathway. And this isn't, you don't need to know this, this is just as a frame of reference for you um, because you guys obviously aren't going to have this impact you, but we can generate some of the other some of the uh, other reactants are possible in that pathway. So here's the net and all the steps, the the dreaded chart that you're going to see, um, the eight step chart where we go from acetyl CoA and oxaloacetate all the way down to our product, which is oxaloacetate at the end, and talks all about the prosthetic groups that we need, all the enzymes and coenzymes that we need in the reactions, etc. All right. I'm going to I'm, now I'm going to th throw back to the beginning, which we talked about diabetic ketoacidosis. <clears throat> so an aldehyde group of the glucose um, can under undergo condensation to yield a colored product. Um, and that's um, the most common one is this O, oh, I think a man had talked about this like the second day of class. She really likes that glucose meter question where the glucose meter got out of whack um, because of some other products. So this O toluidine reacts with glucose to form a glucosamine um, that has a green color, and that's what you can use to measure. That's the assay that you're going to use to, to measure plasma glucose, right? And we use the same thing in a lot of your sensors. So she will actually talk, she'll talk about this in biotech with you, because you guys will spend a lot of time talking about diabetes. This is going to be something you guys are going to see a lot, a lot, a lot of, right? So you can also use arterial blood glass or venous pH levels. Um, so you can use a gas, uh, a gas. Photographer or a gas chromatography and a pH meter to also measure your arterial blood glass or your venous pH levels if you're in the ER where this is happening. So, one of the things that another way you can diagnose this is our, your electrolytes. <clears throat> you can calculate any kind of electrolytic in, in the 
discrepancy, basically your effective osmolarity. You can test for phosphorus. You can test your blood urea nitrogen and creatine levels because all of these processes are going to jack that up significantly. You can test your beta hydroxybutyrate or serum ketones. And um, a urine ketone can be your urine ketones can be tested by a dipstick. So this is all the ways that you can test for this. And I suspect that you will probably see some of these assays as you're doing. I suspect they have some of these. I should actually ask Amanda um, if they have these kits at home for diabetics. Does anyone know that they do these? Can you? Yeah. Well, just okay. So everything is dosage dependent. Your pharmacist, you should beat that into your brain, right? So ketones are necessarily bad in and of themselves. A lot of our products are ketones, right? But if you get too many, it can be problematic. Yeah. That's the problem. So I was like wondering about the, everyone's talking about the keto diet. So oh yeah. Where you, you don't eat any sugar or carbs. Right. So you're gonna. Um, I, I don't know how that would affect, I have to, I'd have to sit down and think about that. So, actually be a good mental exercise to go through, right? Um, <clears throat> I actually haven't thought about the ketone diet at all, but I actually I'll look at it and see if, I've heard about it, and, and for me it's just one of these fad diets that, you know, just messing with your, just messing with all these pathways. It'd be good to think about and how that affects what's going on, because I suspect that, it's just like anything, right? So it says instead of like burning your to burn. So this would be very susceptible to keto. Like, yes, you're right. It would be very susceptible to ketoacidosis, right? And keeping your blood sugar level low is actually a really good thing, right? I mean, we, that's it, something. So I don't eat too much processed sugar. That's just something I try to do. It, it's just a moderation thing. I mean, you know, I, I'll, eat, I'll eat it, right? I just try to minimize it. Not exactly the pinnacle of health, but I mean, I think all, everybody. As long, I think as long as you're in moderation, the ketone diet. Obviously, if you did that for a long time, you'd be settled with this, right? And it wouldn't necessarily be a diabetic ketoacidosis problem, but you'd have a lot of ketones. I bet your breath smells like. I'd be really curious to see if your breath smells like acetone or. <laughs> That's probably why. Now you know why. And you're going to see all this as pharmacists. You're going to see all these crazy things. And, you're going to, and, and it's all biochemistry. So Amanda's going to talk about pharmaceutical biotech with you. And all of these diagnostic tools, are those are the things you're going to see. And, and it's all based on these principles. So a lot of these ketones and stuff are going to start coming up. And they're products of all these cycles that we're going to be going through. Right? So that, you know, this beta hydroxybutyrate, uh, hydroxybutyrate you're going to see, this creatine. Phosphorus, right? We know that that phosphorus is floating around from all the ATP and stuff that we have floating around there. So, all of these things are going to be really important. Now, our blood, <clears throat> our average blood pH is around 7.4. Um, any change greater than 0.10 pH units is really not necessarily a great thing. And the way we do this is we have we have a carbonate buffer, a phosphate buffer, and we have proteins, things like. Um, Serum, serum albumin, right? These all help regulate the blood pH. And all of this goes out of whack when we go into some of these cycles. If we go into the fatty acid cycle, for instance, and we don't go through glycolysis, all of a sudden things are just going to get out of whack on our blood pH level. Because the carbonate, the bicarbonate, the phosphate, and the proteins can't buffer your blood anymore. The, um, I forgot about this. Okay, um, they can't handle it anymore. I actually meant to put that section in front of the. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit, and then I'll come back to this. I want to talk about fatty acid, beta oxidation. So I'm going to skip ahead. I'll come back to that section. I actually meant to put that there. All right, should be doing pretty good on time. Who remembers? what the storage limit that we have is. Triglycerides. Triglycerides, right? And that's basically where we have a glycerol molecule, right? 
and three fatty acid chains. So this is how, what we're talking about today is, how do we process that for energy? Right. So here we have our triacylglycerol, right? So we have our, um, our uh, glycerol molecule here. And here we have our three fatty acid chains. So we have a lipase that's going to come in, and it's going to basically cleave off our fatty acids. Okay? And we're left with glycerol here, and we have a net fatty acid yield of three. It's hydrolyzed in three steps. So lipase does that. Um, when we activate our fatty acids, they're transported into the mitochondria, and that's where we're going to undergo beta oxidation. <coughs> this happens in response to hormone signals like epinephrine, glucagon, and um, we have a receptor here. Hopefully, you're starting to see that all the crap we've talked about is kind of relevant to all these processes. When we talk about enzymes. There's a reason we talk about enzymes, because all these things are done by enzymes. We talked about some of the proteins that are in membranes. Well, here's a 7-TM receptor. That's a hormone receptor. That's actually going to regulate how much of the triglycerides are processed. Okay? So that's going to signal a mechanism, an ad uh, adenylate cyclase, signal amplification mechanism that's going to generate all of these signals. And then that signal gets sent up to the lipase, which is phosphorylated. And then we end up with our lipase being activated. And that's going to generate our glycerol plus our three fatty acid chains. So what we have at the end, our hormone, epinephrine or glucagon or whatever, is going to trigger this cascade that cascade is going to activate the enzyme by a post-translational modification, right? And that post-translational modification is going to generate that fatty acid. Now, what's the what's the hallmark of biosignaling? Why do we have all these steps that we have to do to, in order to get to that step? Why not just go from this step over to this step? What's happening to the signal at every one of these steps? This signal is amplified from one up to millions of times by the time it gets to this signal. So biosignaling is an amplification mechanism. Otherwise, it would just go from this receptor over to the lipase and be done with it, right? If it was a one-to-one -one translation. Obviously, oftentimes, when we talk about these kind of biosignaling events, they are significantly increased as far as the biosignaling pathway goes. That's the reason you add all those steps. Otherwise, it's redundant, right? Unless you need to, uh, the other thing that can be used for is also for regulation. <clears throat> So from a fat cell, obviously, we have our triacylglycerol that can generate our glycerol. That's going to be processed in the liver. And our fatty acids can then be translated, uh, processed in our other tissues. This process, this fatty acid oxidation, is the important step. And we're going to process it, and I'll talk about that. And then that enters in to, what's this cycle? Krebs cycle, I've heard of citric acid cycle. All that, yep. And you can see it enters right at acetyl CoA, right? So that's the, again, that's the reason because a lot of these things are considered a hub. <clears throat> so fatty acids are activated using our favorite molecule, acetyl CoA, or actually just a, a CoA molecule um, that uses an ATP. So we have our Acyl CoA here. We have our acyl group here, and we're going to add that onto our um, through an ad, uh, through an adenine 
an acyl adenate, which is an adenine intermediate, and then from there we're going to have all of our fatty acids added on. So this we have our our acyl CoA, and then this R group is our fatty acid. Why do we have, make that an R and not just have the fatty acid on there? Yes, they're long. What else? Are they the same? Fifty-fifty. No, they're not the same. They can be any number of different. Depends on what, whether you had a cheeseburger for lunch or whether you had a salad for lunch, right? You went to Burger King, you had a, got a, your big fat cheeseburger. Right? It's going to be vastly different than if you were healthy. <coughs> so our fatty acid act, uh, activation can be rendered irreversible um, if we add a pyrophosphate to it, so which is basically another phosphate group. So it can be loaded and activated. So if we add one, if we add one phosphate to it, right? then it's, uh, it's uh, still reversible. Once we add our second one, it's irreversible. Here it kind of shows some of our other, how, how we start to process after it being activated by a CoA. So we have our acyl-CoA with our fatty acid. We're going to add a carnitine in there. So we have our acyl carnitine. Here's where the fatty acid is, right? And we're going to get rid of our OA molecule. So here it's spun off. Um, this is across a membrane. So we have a trans uh, locase that's going to have to occur. And so we're going to transport it across, and we're going to end up with acyl carnitine. And then we're going to again spit off our uh, our CoA, uh, CoA molecule onto. Uh, Acyl-CoA and we're going to carnitine and we can spit it across this, this uh, membrane as we need to based on whether we add a CoA or take off a CoA. <clears throat> and this is this molecule or this uh, membrane that we're going across is generally the mitochondria. It allows us to translate, translocate it across the mitochondrial space. That's what the carnitine does. Okay, <clears throat> here's the meat of beta oxidation. Everything happens with two and two. You guys discuss. Oh, actually, we don't. We don't discuss this in the next one. So everything happens with two with fatty acids, two carbons. First step, <clears throat> we have our CO CoA. We're going to have an oxidation. FADH is going to be reduced. And our fatty acid is going to be oxidized. So notice now we have a double bond in this first uh, carbon location. Okay, so that's where it's going to end up getting cleaved. Okay, then we have a hydration. Right, we're going to add a hydroxyl group. We take off that. So here's here's the actual naming. We call it beta oxidation. The reason it's called a beta oxidation is because we have our alpha and beta, right? So we have a beta oxidation, right? That's the first step. Then we have a hydration reaction here, where we're going to add a, we're going to actually add an oxygen to this. So we end up with hydroxy, um, hydroxy acyl CoA. We have another oxidation step where we're going to add a second carboxyl group here. So we end up with a keto acyl CoA. From there, we're going to so we're going to thi um, thiolysis, right? We'll basically end up with um, our acetyl CoA and our acyl CoA, and it's shortened by two at carbon atoms. So this is where we actually cleave off. The reason this looks kind of funny is because we're actually going to cleave off two carbon molecules. So this step is then just going to be repeated over and over and over. So the four reaction steps are an oxidation, a hydrolysis or a hydration, an oxidation, and then a thiolysis.
those are the four steps that we're under, going to undergo. Okay. Again, this is called beta oxidation because we're actually attacking this beta step, and these are the two carbon that are going to be chopped off. So here's our carboxy group, right? And the fatty acid, that's our carboxy, carboxyl head group. And then we have our alpha, alpha carbon, our beta carbon, and this is where we start. This, these two molecules are actually going to be molecules that are going to be cleaved off. That's why we call it beta oxidation. So, here are the reaction overviews. <coughs> Up to this step right here, right? And I sometimes forget these steps in beta oxidation. <coughs> the carnitine is actually used to transport across the mitochondrial membrane, and then we have these four steps that we just described in beta oxidation, and we're going to end up with acetyl-CoA and acyl-CoA as our steps, and we have all of the enzymes that describe those six steps. So, here's an example. One round of beta, of beta oxidation. So let's say we have a palmitate molecule that we're going to show here, the top. What ends up happening in that one reaction, right, <clears throat> we're going to spit off, um, and we're going to have, these are the two, this is the two carbon that's going to be generated, and we're now down, actually all the way through down here, we're all the way down, and we're going to end up, sorry, right here is where we end up spinning it off, right? We end up keeping chunk, chunking it down all the way till the end here, and we're going to we'll be able to generate 106 molecules of ATP from that molecule. So you can see there's still C7 here, right? And we're going to chunk off the two, right, and the blue ones, and then we chunk off the two green ones, and then we chunk off here, and we just keep going and keep going and keep going and keep going all the way through, and we end up with 106 molecules out of ATP because it feeds into which cycle? Krebs cycle. Right? Right there, that feeds into the Krebs cycle. So this is one round of beta oxidation. This is a complete for a C16 palmitoyl CoA. That's how many you get into with eight acetyl CoAs. Seven FADHs, seven NADHs, and seven protons. Those are all going to be used to generate power in the mitochondria. <coughs> what's the difference between a saturated and a poly, or what's an unsaturated fatty acid? Double bonds. Double bonds, right? So if we have unsaturated, we have multiple double bonds, and when we have polyunsaturated fatty acids, um, we have to have a cis-delta-3 enoyl-CoA isomerase, which is very lovely to say, in order to process. Um, because 2,4-dienoyl-CoA is generated, and that can't be processed by normal enzymes, so we're going to convert it into a trans-delta-3 enoyl CoA by a 2,4-dienoyl-CoA reductase. And then the isomerase converts that product into a trans-delta-2-enoyl-CoA, which is a normal part of the process. Now, I don't necessarily expect you to know that for the test. That's informational. Unsaturated fats can have odd numbers, but generally they don't. Um, and so if they do, um, we're going to have to have um, require an isomerase. Even number of double bonds require both isomerase and a reductase.
<coughs> so beta oxidation cannot degrade unsaturated fats alone. Here's basically more of that same um, description. A monounsaturated fatty acid is degraded by this, that cysts, uh, delta-3 enoyl carboxylic CoA, by that uh, acyl CoA dehydrogenase, as we described there. And this is the, the reaction that occurs in those double bonds in order to break those double bonds and get things rolling into the process. <coughs> I'm not going to go into great detail on this. You can look at all the reactions if you'd like. We're basically moving double bonds around in this. If we have an unsaturated fatty acid, um, this enoyl-CoA isomerase and the 2,4-dienoyl-CoA reductase can move those double bonds around and actually reduce them so that, that they can be processed by beta oxidation. Ketone bodies, this is where you're talking about the ketone diet, this is where we're talking about ketoacidosis, that is a fuel source that's derived from fat. And ketone body synthesis takes place in the liver, so we end up with acetoacetate, 3-hydroxybutyrate, and acetone, and then those are all synthesized from acetyl-CoA in the liver, and then they're secreted into the blood for use. So if you're, if you're processing fat, that's what you're going to generate. 3-hydroxybutyrate is formed when we reduce acetoacetate, and acetone is generated by the spontaneous decarboxylation. What's another name for decarb? What do we get out of decarboxylation? What's the pro one of the products in decarboxylation? Carbon dioxide. So here's how we form our ketone bodies. It's formed primarily in the mitochondria in the liver, and it can be used as a fuel source. And again, this is where we start to get some of our issues with the diabetic ketoacidosis. <clears throat> Here's the pathway describing how in the liver we can go from acetyl-CoA all the way down to 3-hydroxy-3-methyl-glutaryl-CoA. Acetoacetate is the product here as we, shut, as we spin off our um, uh, CoA molecule. And then from there, we can end up with 3-hydroxybutyrate and acetone. And these, this right here, is the classic ketone body problem. And this is where you see your breast smelling like acetone and 3-hydroxybutyrate has a very similar structure, and so it also smells very similar. <clears throat> And this kind of gives the steps on how we process, how we utilize uh, D3-hydroxybutyrate and um, acetoacetate as a fuel. And those are oxidized to acetoacetate. And then from acetoacetate, we can then go again to acetone. <coughs> Here's your keto diet. Now, a couple things. If there's drug-resistant epilepsy, some of these diets are really beneficial for people with kids and children suffering from drug-resistant epilepsy. So there's some advantageous. Now this is where like gluten-free diets, right? Somebody decided gluten-free diets were for everybody, but really they're just for people who have gluten intolerance, right? Everyone decided, oh, let's go do gluten-free. Well, it doesn't affect most of us, right? Necessarily. The same way it does them. They'll have a gluten intolerant, intolerance. And uh, basically you end up, I don't remember if it's glutamine or glutamate, there's an inability for an enzyme to process one of those and that creates a, an immune response and that's what you get, gluten intolerance. Well, not all of us have that problem. And so to have a gluten-free diet when you don't have that problem is kind of silly, right? Because gluten tastes very good. <laughs> Same thing here when we talk about ketone bodies. Uh, it, it does have, there are people who it's good for. Um, and so somebody decided it was probably good for that person, so let's make it a fad diet, and that's probably what you're seeing. Now, I'm not saying fads, you know, low carb 
diets are necessarily horrible. I, I think low carb, but moderate carb is are good for you. So, <clears throat> animals cannot convert fatty acids to glucoses. Fatty acids are converted, converted again to acetyl-CoA. Oxaloacetate is a citric acid cycle intermediate, and it's a precursor to glucose. Um, Acetyl-CoA derived from fats cannot lead to net synthesis of oxaloacetate or glucose because um, even though we have two carbons that enter the cycle, um, two carbons are lost as CO2 before oxaloacetate is regenerated. So we can't go from fat to glucose as animals. That's the bottom line of what this is saying. We could generate energy, but we cannot generate glucose. And again, diabetes can lead to life-threatening excess of ketone bodies which is important. I'm going to go back. Actually, I'm not. I thought we were getting close to the end, but we're not. Um, one of the things that you're going to find is, and this is one of the reasons why it's pretty important that I mentioned that we can't go from fatty acid to glucose because glucose is the main fuel for your brain. And so um, if we're going to starve, protein degradation becomes the source of carbon for gluconeogenesis. And where do we get our proteins from, generally, if we're on a starva in starvation mode? If we can't process them with fatty acids, where are they coming from? Muscle, which, because of proteins, right? Protein degradation is the way you're going to get your, during starvation. And you can have starvation on certain diets, right? So you're, this is where you're going to start seeing more and more ketone bodies synthesized from fat, and you're going to see all kinds of, of problems. We do have a fuel reserve in, a, you know, in us, and some of us have more than others. <laughs> you can put me on a fatty, or you know, on a, on a starvation diet, and that'd probably be better for me. So we do have a certain amount just built up, glucose, glycogen, triacylglycerols, and mobilized proteins, and you can see all those tissues do a, some of them do a pretty good job of storing up those molecules. And so you can see like, you know, some of our tri adipose tissues have some pretty good storage, you know, half a million joules there, so, or kilo, uh, kilocalories, sorry, half a million kilocalories there in our adipose tissue. Uh, muscle has mobilized, you know, 100,000 proteins, 100,000 kilocalories of proteins. So, there's quite a bit of storage that's built up. If you go into starvation mode, you will start to lose your glucose. Your fatty acids <clears throat> will actually go up and start to tail off. And our ke your keto as far as um, in your plasma level, your ketone bodies will start to increase. Your fatty acids will start to increase because that will be the main mechanism by which you'll start using the fuel. And then your glucose will tail off as, a, as you get into starvation mode. And this kind of gives you an idea of how much fuel is consumed in a 24-hour period, and most of it you'll note is, is your glucose. Um, <coughs> this is basically talking about trans fats are bad, and I think, I think we've all known that for a while now. They used, to, they used to talk about saturated and unsaturated, and I don't think that's necessarily a thing anymore. I think we've pretty well ruled that out. Okay, let's go back to, we'll spend about 10 minutes talking about, I, I missed a few important points when we were talking about glycogen degradation. In fact, I, I don't know that I talked about this as much as, uh, I talked about it briefly, but I, there's a few points that I want to add. Again, glycogen is a complex carbohydrate that has alpha-1,4 and alpha-1,6 linkages, and we can cleave those off, okay? Um, it's, a, it's regulated by blood glucose. There's a phosphorylase that exists in two forms, and this is where I want to talk to you about it. This is more of an enzyme point than it is about the glycogen cycle. So phosphorylase exists in a less active B form and a more active A form. And we talked about, I talked very briefly yesterday about a uh, relaxed versus tense form. The default state is a relaxed form, and glucose is a negative regulator of this phosphorylase. 
and it transitions that phosphorylase from an R state, the relaxed state, to the T state or the tense state. And the tense state is the one that actually allows for the processing to occur. An important cofactor in this is PLP, which is uh, paradoxical phosphate, and that's a B6 vitamin. You'll notice that there's a trend, and I'll mention the vitamin Bs quite a bit, and it serves as a prosthetic group for this glycogen phosphorylase. That's an important cofactor coenzyme in that process. PLP is held in the active site, uh, site by a shift, shift base linkages, and that forms with a lysine residue. The lysine residue, and this is the enzyme. Um, the, right here is the ly uh, lysine group. Right, you see the amine groups. Here's our PLP molecule, and then here is our phosphate group. So this is a shift base intermediate, and in contrast to other enzymes, the phosphate that you see there is involved in an acid-base catalysis, which is a little bit different than what you'd see normally. This is kind of going back to the enzyme chapter. This phosphate substrate binds between the phosphate and the PLP, and the glycosidic O-linking of the terminal glucose that's on the, um, that's on the glycogen. So we basically get a linkage that occurs between this phosphate and the glycosidic linkages on the, on the non, or on the reducing end of the glucose. And we end up with the phosphate attacking the first carbon, and we cleave out the glucose, and that's going to lead a glucose one phosphate. Now, there's a drug class that's going to treat this chloroindole carboxamide. Well, I shouldn't say that. A drug class is this chloroindole carboxamide that's going to that's going to be uh, tr trying to treat hyperglycemia, which is what is hyperglycemia? Hypo means hyper means high. high. Hyper means high. There's a drug class to teach. So we have high, if we have high blood sugar, right? There's a, this car, uh, chloroindole carbo, uh, carboxamides are inhibitors of this glycogen phosphorylase. It's an aliste they're an allosteric inhibitor of that. So it binds the dimer interface, and that's going to stabilize our tense state or inactive state conformation. So you can actually look this up on the PDB. There's a 1EM6 is the... PDB number. The question, why would an inhibitor of glycogen phosphorylase be a suitable treatment for diabetes? Anyone want to try to venture a guess on that? What does this enzyme do again? Okay, let's start with what diabetes is. What's diabetes? <coughs> mm -hmm. So what's the consequence of that? Your blood sugar is way high, right? And what's wrong with high blood sugar? It can. Why? What's wrong with glucose? When you're not using your glucose, so it's you are not. That's true. Yourself. Is that? But is that? Is that the path? You know, is that the pathology? Is it path? Is just because you're not using it? Like why is it, why is too much a bad thing? Is what I'm trying to get at. Is glucose good for you? Is glucose stable? Is glucose reactive? It's very reactive, right? We have antioxidants to try to get rid of things that are reactive. Glucose is very reactive. So if you have a lot of it, what's going to happen?
what happens in diabetes. What are some of the side effects of diabetes? Okay. It's a good one, but I'm not trying to think. That's not one, one that I'm thinking of. Blind. You're blind. Why? Yeah, you get you get damaged, right? Glucose damages things. So the glucose is floating around. That's one of the key areas where you're going to start to see damage. So your glucose level gets high. It's going to start reacting to things. And it's going to start destroying tissue, healthy tissue, right? This is why you see things with like bed sores and stuff when you guys are doing your rotations in <clears throat> in the hospitals you're gonna see some pretty nasty bed sores from diabetes because diabetes the blood sugar and basically that's glucose attacking your body okay so let's go to this point why would a drug class to treat hyperglycemia be appropriate for a glycogen phosphorylase What does glycogen phosphorylase do? Yep. So keep going. Keep talking. Why? So this is, these are glucose, right? Or other six carbon sugars, right? Why is it keeping it in this form okay and not having it in glucose? Yes, right? The reactive, what's the reactive part of glucose? The, no, exactly. Where it form, well, at the sites where it forms the bond, the glycosidic bonds, right? That's what actually the part that actually does that. So if I have glucose in these, in glycogen form, it's not reactive. So if I block, uh, glycogen phosphorylase, right, which this molecule here, how, what am I keeping glucose in? What form? Glycogen. glycogen. And is glycogen good or bad? Good. It's good compared to glucose, right? <clears throat> so if I make a drug that inhibits this enzyme, is that a good thing or a bad thing for a diabetic's perspective? Good, because I have now everything in glycogen. Does that mean it has, that, that, that there's no consequences to that? No, that doesn't mean there's no consequences to that. But that means that you may be able to attack one problem. You may generate another. Hopefully, the side effects aren't anywhere. Because when you're messing with metabolism, you're messing with the, it, this, it's a big deal. <coughs> Again, here's kind of the structure of this phosphorylase. I, um, I want to, like, take a, you're going to, at the end of the semester, you have to, kind of take this holistic approach to studying why we're studying this, right? Kind of take a holistic approach to biochemistry. And the first, and in the first couple of units, we talked, we started talking about protein structure. We talked about the active sites of enzymes. We talked about enzymes and regulation. We talked about how the shape of the, I, I like to take this all the way back, right? So here is this enzyme. We, and every single step in these metabolic processes are enzymes or enzyme complexes, right? And they're all catalysts. They all have intermediates and they all have these enzymatic processes and properties. So in the catalytic site right here, right, where these things occur, we have a serine that is phosphorylated in the, between the two different states. And that phosphate then allows it to go from the two different states, from the R state to the T state, okay? And one's more catalytically active, based on just a simple phosphorylation event, post-translational modification that occurs. Hopefully, we're getting to tie two and three and four concepts together. What are, we, what are the concepts that we have here? We have enzymes. So we have all the things associated with enzyme kinetics. We have something that's chomping up. What is it chomping up? Glycogen, right? So it's just chomping up glycogen into, into glucose, right? We have allosteric properties of an enzyme, right? We have amino acids because we have a serine that gets phosphorylated. So we have bonds 
We have allosteri. We have enzymes. All of this stuff that we're starting to see in each one of these steps. We have six and eight and ten step processes. And the electron transport chain, we're going to have up to 40 proteins in one complex. Right? And you saw today earlier how all these complexes kind of fit together. And hopefully, it starts to kind of give, give you an understanding. <clears throat> I said that backwards at the initial. R state is active, the T state is less active. Because the T state has that serine that's partially blocked by phosphorylation. So phosphorylase B is inactive because it favors the T state based on that phosphorylation. So the active site is open in the R state, right? But it's partially blocked in the T state based on this phosphorylation here. And that phosphorylation kind of blocks that site so it doesn't allow it to be as open. It's more regulated, regulated there. <coughs> you can see how glucose kind of fits into that site and then just get cleaves, cleaved off. Um, oh, and also we have different phosphorylases in the liver and in the muscle that have different efficiencies. So, All right. Oops, I did not mean to go too far. I went too far. So if we're going back to the beginning. So if we're going to treat diabetic ketoacidosis, this will be the last little bit for us. If we're going to treat diabetic ketoacidosis, we can do fluid replacement. Our drugs are insulin, right? Why do we want insulin? Right. So what is that going to, now tell me the mechanism of how does that work? What's going to happen if I give them insulin? It's going to lower their blood sugar, right? How, how does that work? I, I had a great model of an insulin receptor, right? I think it was like the second day of class, right? It binds to insulin, binds the insulin receptor. We have GLUT4, which is a ion channel. That's going to allow glucose to go through the membrane and go into the cell, right? There's your drug, insulin. Some we could treat by, with bicarbonate. What does bicarbonate do? It is, but not here. Gives you a, there's a, just read it up there. What's the, what's the key word with bicarbonate? pH. Bicarbonate is a buffer. <clears throat> I think this treatment is mixed, but that's also an option. A lot of times we also have uh, uh, electrolytes that are deficient, so potassium, phosphate, manganese, sodium, those will help buffer, and they're also important cofactors that go on. So um, this is kind of, I'll, I'll, I'm not going to spend any more time, I think we've discussed this one. This is just a pretty picture that describes how um, diabetic ketoacidosis occurs. So, um, And if you want to get in, this is a great, I know some of you are already doing this one, but I think this is a great case study because you can talk about all the mechanisms. There's all different kinds of things that are going on throughout the whole topics that span the entire semester. There's great infographics that you can see, right? So, and describing the biochemistry, you're going to have drug targets in there that you're going to have to use, so it would be a really good case study. This is an example of a good case study, diabetic ketoacidosis. It's very prevalent. The biochemistry is clear. We understand it very much. There's a lot of discussion. A lot of things you could, a lot of avenues you could take to go down that path. So, do you guys have any questions about that? Is it, how many of you guys have settled on a topic? Here? At this point, you should probably be settling on a topic. If you're struggling, what are you struggling with? Too many? Not enough? Not enough time? That's fair.